Getting those booklets out. Can we quickly do it real fast? Um, welcome to what I think will be one of the most life-changing messages um, that you'll ever hear on money. Um, we'll, we need to get these booklets out real fast because we're running out of time. We've got big print or small print. Me, I have to have big print. But uh, as I heard someone say, so do I. Who was that? Yeah, that was John Winther. Make sure John Winther gets a big copy. <laughs> okay, let's start. Thank you. Let's get into it as the notes are being handed out. Today, I want to talk to you around the topic, no, no, YOLO. <laughs> You're familiar with the phrase? Yeah. YOLO. Come on, help me with it. One, two, three. YOLO. You only live once. That's for the few uninitiated people. YOLO. We mean you only live once. Who wants to get an ice cream? YOLO. Who'd like to take a trip? YOLO. You only live once. Have fun. Life's a party. You have, you deserve it. You should have it. Buy the car. YOLO. Take a trip. YOLO. Girlfriend, get the dress. YOLO. YOLO. You only live once. Here's the problem. The Bible doesn't teach that you only live once. If the Bible taught that your life was only to count for your lifetime, then we could all be walking around saying YOLO. But the Bible teaches that a good person should make it their goal financially to live three times. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. But a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children. They live once, they live twice, they live three times. To live biblically in the arena of my finances, it means that from the start of my life or from this day forward, I make it my goal to think, how can my financial decisions make a difference in the next two generations after me? I'm supposed to think, not YOLO, but YOLT. I know it doesn't quite work. It's a dad joke. Stay with me. Not YOLO, but YOLT. You only live three times. We should make it our aim to live three times. I need a vision and a plan to make a financial impact in the next two generations after me. Wow. Wow. That opens my eyes to a completely different level of thinking. That puts my money decisions in a whole new category. God wants me to make a financial blessing to the next two generations. You know, the problem that we have is that often, especially in the West, we often have two challenges in our finances. Number one, we think too small. And number two, we plan only for the short term. At best, in the West, we, th we save for maybe our next holiday or potentially to buy our first home. And God is saying, no, I want you to think bigger. I want you to think legacy. I want you to think not about just the next milestone, but about what you want to end up doing and being in your life. Our goal should be to think not just about our lifetime, but the lifetimes that come after us. In fact, Jesus clearly taught us that in anything we attempt to do with our lives, that we should have a plan. Luke chapter 14 and verse 28. This is our text for this morning. Luke 14, 28. The Bible says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not or will she not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is unable to finish it, everyone who sees him will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build, but he was not able to finish. He didn't have a plan. Friends, it's important for you and I to remember that your life is that tower. Do you have the resources to finish what you've begun? Where are you going in your financial future? The scripture is encouraging us that we need to have a plan and that we need to take positive steps, that we need to be ready to move forward. I need to make it my life's goal 
that I'll make a difference not only in my lifetime, but in the next two generations after me. So let's locate ourselves this morning, all right? Okay, let's ask ourselves, in terms of your money, where are you at? Do you have a goal? Where would you like to end up? Do you have a plan for your financial future? Well, here's the encouragement. It's never too late to have a plan. And it's also never too early to have a plan. Whether you are seven years old or 70, God is saying, let's get moving. Let's plan our steps. And then let's watch what the Lord will do. So today I want to give you six points. So this is the most specific and teaching oriented message of this series. I want to give you six points on how to have a plan. Are you ready? Three people in the front row. Are you ready? All right. Number one, get a vision. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. In the NIV Bible, it's translated, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. And we see this financially everywhere we go. If you don't have a vision for your finances, you cast off restraint. Without a vision for your finances, you're going to spend too much money on movies and lattes. But when we have vision, we put on restraint. We deny pleasure to ourselves today because of what we believe we will have in the days that are to come. Where there is no vision, we waste resources. Opportunities are lost. We dissipate our focus. And the power of vision is that it gives you focus. We need a vision. We need a vision. We need to come alive with a clear sense, God has a plan for my financial future. God wants me to make a difference, not only in my lifetime now, but in the next two generations after me. I spoke to a, I spoke to a young girl just about two weeks ago in our church. She's 25 years old and just purchased her first home in Wellington. In Wellington, 25 years old. I said to her, I said, how on earth have you done that? She said, John, from the time my parents started giving me pocket money, my mom said we have to do two things. Number one, you give your first 10% to God because that's your tithe. Number two, you save 10% for your future. By the time I was in high school, my mom was saying to me, your goal needs to be to own your first home by the time you're in your mid-20s. And her mother and her came up with a plan. All through university, she worked that plan. She got her first job, she worked that plan. And a couple of months ago, she bought her first home single at the age of 25. Now, some people are hearing this saying, that's not possible. Other people will be saying, that's a miracle. I would say it's a testimony to the power of vision. That from the time she was very young... She was aiming to do something that other people didn't have the vision for. Remember, friends, vision is not about resources. It's not about having more money. I'm not asking you to change your financial position. I'm asking you to get a bigger vision, to see a higher horizon. Because here's the truth. The same resources with a greater vision produce a totally different result. I want to say it again. The same resources with a greater vision produce a totally different result. John 4.35, Jesus said to his disciples, open your eyes for the harvest is ripe. He's saying so much more is possible than what you're achieving right now because you fail to have the vision. Wow. Number two, the second thing we're going to do, we're going to get a vision and then we're going to get a view. We're going to get a view. My son, Will, played five glorious winters of soccer, football. It was five of the most enjoyable winters of my life. I was the assistant coach the whole time. Truth be told, I probably loved it more than he did. And we had a great time. In our first season, I was the assistant coach, but we did not do well. We got beat all the time. It was deflating, not fun. I know it's all about participation, but let's be honest. We just want to win. And I'd be there on the sidelines, and I don't know a lot about football. I just wanted to make sure that the culture of the experience would mean my kids and other kids would keep coming back, no angry dad kind of thing. So I worked on that side while the coach did the other. And I noticed that there was another dad on the sideline, and he was watching the game, but he seemed to understand what was going on. 
He was like, they're open on the wing. They need to get back. They're about to press forward on the attack. Move back, move back. And I started to realize he could tell what was going on. So I got him to come to our practices. Year two, he became our head coach. And once we had a coach that could see what was going on, we had entire seasons where we were undefeated. In one year, we finished, we were the second team. One year, we finished higher than the club's first team at the end of the season. And the reason why, everything changed when we had someone who saw what was going on. Often, we aren't winning financially because we can't see what is going on. The second thing we need is we need to get a view. We have to be able to see what is going on. We have to be able to understand what is taking place in the arena of our finances. We have to get a view. If we don't have a view, we're never going to be able to move forward. On week two, I talked about the fact that I sat down with Jillian one day and I said, hey, baby, we've turned our trampoline, uh, our bank account into a trampoline. You remember that one? The money is landing and then kaboing, it is bouncing straight back out again. What preceded that? was that I noticed that our finances were going in the wrong direction and I didn't know what was going on at all. Guys, you will never change what you do not understand. Write it down. You will never change what you do not understand. So I sat down with our bank statements and I started looking at what was going on. I spent hours doing this. I made some columns, got out Excel. I had house expenses, power, insurance, rent, higher purchase on that blasted lounge suite, car expenses, <laughs> repayments, petrol, Warren and Reggio, insurance, servicing, tire replacement, entertainment, food, movies. And then I, I loaded under each of those the date and the amount of any expenditure that had left our account. Once I had about three or four months in my columns, I started to get a view. I could see what was going on with my money for the first time. You won't change your money situation if you can't tell what's going on. Now, some people are out there like, John, I suck at numbers. Can I say that in church? The truth is, friends, I guarantee that if you are poor in the arena of money, you are brilliant at something else. If you are poor in numbers and understanding numbers, you are brilliant at something else that money people, numbers people are terrible at. Not understanding numbers doesn't make you bad with money, but not asking people for help does. You don't have the option to put your head in the sand. You don't have the option to say, this is not my thing. The Bible says that when there is no counsel, the people fall. But in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. So find somebody else. You might be great at parenting, terrible at budgeting. Find somebody else who hopefully is really good at budgeting and really bad at parenting. Then you can go quid pro quo. But find someone and say, find someone you trust who is financially secure and who isn't trying to sell you anything. And say, listen, can you help me out? Can you help me to get this figured out? Because the truth is, friends, that unless we can get a perspective, we are never going to break through. How, where am I going? I need to get a view. I need to understand how much is coming in, how much is going out. We want what is coming in to go up, and we want what is going out to go down. We're going to go super practical today, okay? You will never change what you do not understand, and you will never change what you do not understand own. It's your finances. Nobody's coming to save you. Do you want me to say it again? Nobody's coming to save you. You need to get a view. Once we have a vision and we've got a view, the third thing we need to do is close our circle. This is a phrase Jillian and I created when we were in the first stage of dealing with the mess in our finances. We realized that there was a certain amount of money that was going to go out each fortnight or month to make to encompass our living expenses. That became what we called our circle. And the goal number three is to close your circle. You do this two ways. Number one, get it locked in so that it doesn't grow. Super practical. You need to make sure that your circle can't, at a whim or with a certain set of changing circumstances, suddenly go through the roof. You want to get it locked and loaded. 
And number two, you want to reduce that circle down as small as you can. Proverbs 21.20. This is a very powerful verse for our finances. In the house of the wise, there are stores of choose, choice food and oil. And a foolish man devours all he has. Wow. The Bible says the sign between wisdom and folly is whether everything you receive is going out again or whether part of it is being stored. It is not a good thing when everything is coming in and everything is going straight back out. Our starting assumption to closing our circle is that how much I am spending each fortnight or month can be reduced. There are some people listening to this right now and literally you are up against the wall financially and I am praying for you. I am believing for breakthrough, but the majority of people hearing this talk right now will be spending money on things they don't really need. Your circle is larger than it needs to be. And our goal is to reduce the amount of money that we consume just to live. We're going to sit down with our view and we're going to ask ourselves some financial questions. How can I reduce what is going out? Do I need everything that I'm currently spending money on? Is it a want or is it a need? In light of my vision and my goals, is this expenditure helping or hindering where I want to get to in my life? And how can I eliminate, eliminate impulse spending from my life? How can I make sure that it's simply not possible? Do I need Netflix, Neon, Amazon Prime, gym membership, personal trainer sessions at the gym, bought coffee? Contrary to common New Zealand opinion, you will not become wildly uncool or die by drinking instant coffee. Yes, pause for a round of applause. This is mind-blowing for some. Entitlement is one of the greatest money traps of our generation. And it has no basis in Scripture. Say it again, my wife's saying. Entitlement is one of the greatest money traps of our generation. We live in a world where everybody thinks they deserve it. The humanism that is coming through our education is pervading the way we interact with our finances and doubling up with the fact that delayed gratification is somehow not desirable. So now we have an entitled generation. You should have it. Others have it and you deserve it. You should have their level of house. You should have the same car as them. You are entitled to a certain standard. Listen to me. Entitlement will keep you poor. Entitlement will keep you poor. It's not about what you are entitled to. It's about what is best for you in this moment. You might not be able to afford a gym membership right now. You might not be able to afford living without a border in your house right now. So close your circle. Reduce your costs. Be willing to go without. Get back to what you need and not just to what you want. Why? Because a fool devours all he has. Okay, the fourth thing we're going to do is we're going to set our ideal. Our ideal. Here's our question. In an ideal world, what would my budget look like? I need a perspective of what a good budget should actually look like. This this is not about where I am right now. That comes later. This is about if I wasn't in debt, if my income was at a decent level. How would I decide where my money would go? What would be important to me? This is important because the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 9, that in his heart, a man plans his course and the Lord directs his steps. If you want God to get your back, you need to know in your heart where you're wanting to go. If you know where you're going, God can help you get there. So set your ideal. Know where you want to go. As I mature in my financial journey, this is where I want my money to go. I will invest this much. I will give this much. I will live on this much. Now, you might not be there when you first prepare your budget, but by setting the principles, you know what you're moving towards. Without setting the ideal, it's very likely that you're going to underinvest in areas that will be key to your financial future. So here's a a target for what I think we should 
head towards. I'm going to throw it out. Your money, you get to decide. But here's a model I think is healthy to work towards. 10, 10, 10, 70. 10, 10, 10, 70. My first tenth, I tithe it. My second tenth, I earmark for giving and generosity. My third tenth, I invest. And 70%, that's for me. My tithe comes first because it belongs to God and I return it to Him. I'm going to give 10% because that's my seed and that's my purpose. I'm alive to expand God's kingdom and to make the world a better place. I invest 10% because God wants me to be a blessing in the next two generations after me. And I live on the rest. 10, 10, 10, 70. Without ideals and guidelines, we often become too narrow in what we're seeking to do with our finances. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to set an ideal. It's your money. You set your ideal, but make sure that you have a goal for where you would like to go. So number one, I have a vision. Number two, I get a view. Number three, I close my circle. Number four, I set my ideal. And with all of that, I then get a budget. I get a budget. John Maxwell says a budget is telling money what to do rather than wondering where it went. It's telling money what to do rather than wondering where it went. A budget is today's decisions around your finances. Today's decisions. It's saying, this is my income. This is what I'm going to spend it on. These are the limits that I'm going to have. That's my budget. A budget is making a few big decisions that eliminate a lot of small decisions. I believe in this so powerfully in every arena of life. Make a few big decisions that eliminate a lot of small ones. Because be aware of this. Every day, someone is going to try to get you to make a financial decision on their behalf. Buy this bargain t-shirt. Get this coffee. Go out for lunch. All the girls are. Just this, <laughs> this just dropped. This just dropped. Isn't it amazing how retailers have discovered that? This just dropped. And it's a limited run. Subscribe to this app. You can unlock these extra features. You'll get rich, lose weight, get in shape, gain followers, release your creative genius. Everybody's trying to get you to part with your money. So your budget is a big decision. This is what I'm going to do. I don't make small decisions. I've already made a big one. It's locked and loaded. I've done it. This is what I'm going to do. And I've made my budget. Here's my goal for you. Set your budget however works best for you. I have 16 different bank accounts. That's what Jillian and I do. It works for us. You might have one, whatever works for you, but set it up in a way that works for you and then stick to it. You won't get it right the first time. Learning to budget is about never quitting on the journey. It's about keep coming back to the budget, review it every day when you first make one, every week once you've got it ground in, but start with something, get counsel and accountability if you need it, and never break your system. One more thing I want to say about your budget. Your process is more important than your goal. Your process is more important than your goal. Your budget is your process. Far too many people say, I've set a goal, John. I'm going to save $10,000. Great. But what's the process? It'll be better to say, my spending money will be 20 bucks a week and I'll make my lunch every day because that's my process. If I have the process and obsess about the process, it's going to help me get to the goal. Everybody on board so far? And here's the sixth thing that we're going to do. We're going to stay focused and consistent. Okay, We've gone all the way through to the point where we've got a budget. Now we're going to engage. And once we engage, we stay focused and consistent. The worst thing you could do with this financial series is get inspired. And then in a month, you've dropped it. It's not going to work if you drop it. Stay focused and consistent. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 11. Now you also must complete the doing of it. That as there was a readiness to desire it, may there now also be a completion of it from what you have. In other words, set your budget, stick to it, stay focused, don't quit. Wealth comes slowly. So if we're going to move forward in the arena of our finances, we're going to have to stay focused and consistent. Guys, you have to believe that God can prosper you. 
You have to believe that progress is possible. You have to know that God can move you forward in your finances and allow you to make a difference in the next generations that follow after you. The hardest $100 to earn is your first $100. The hardest $1,000 to save is the first $1,000 you've ever saved. The hardest house to buy is the first house you will buy. And the hardest million to make, I've heard, is the first million that you ever make. But we've got to stay focused and consistent. All right, let me illustrate this for you. Oh, wow. You guys, you know, get up here as quick as you can. We need about three or four people to help. I want to give you an illustration today on how we can move forward in the arena of our finances. Because my friend, I believe that the right steps are going to empower you to move forward in the arena of your finances. Bring it up here, guys, nice and close. So this is how it's going to work. This is how it's going to work. Give my team a big clap. They're doing a great job here. All righty, all righty, all righty. Fantastic. Okay, so this is what happens. I've got some $5 notes up here right now. Money, money. Come and get it. Money, money. Come and get it. Come and get it. Anyway, in Wellington, whenever we do the money, money, I try and get the crowd to go, money, money. This stirs up any religious spirit. I'm I'm into it. Okay, I've got 10 $5 notes, okay? Let's assume that this is your pay packet. So when I start on the journey of improving my finances, I firstly have three buckets. I'm in debt, I'm messed up financially, I've heard the series, I wanna turn my life around. So the first thing that I'm gonna do, my first 10%, my first $5 is my tithe, and I give that to the Lord. Now, when it comes to my circle, my living expenses, I've been used to living on the entire $50 that I get paid. But now I've been closing my circle and setting my budget. And I've reduced my circle of living to $35. So then I'm going to use my $35 to live on. They put the bucket the wrong way around. Now I've got to pull that one out. Here we go. And then the third thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start to save a disaster fund, $1,000. Why? Because if you don't have a disaster fund, you're going to end up back in debt when something breaks in your finances. So my first goal is to save $1,000. So then I get paid again. Another fortnight goes by and I tithe my five. I live on my 35 and I put the rest into my disaster fund. Week after week, week after week, I keep going until my $1,000 is saved. Once I have that, I put it away. Next goal is to focus on my debt. Now I'm going to move forward. I'm getting all of my debt gone. So the first $5 is my tithe. I give that to the Lord. Then I have my $35 and I'm going to live on that. And this now goes towards my debt. And I'm going to pay off my debt by doing this. I'm going to start with the smallest debt first. I'm going to pay that off. If you weren't here for week two, decline debt. Make sure you listen to it. But regardless of interest, I'm going to pay off my smallest debt so that I get momentum. It's called the Dave Ramsey debt snowball. 30% faster you'll pay off your finances if you move from smallest debt to largest debt. Okay, so that's what I got. But now something crazy has happened. I got a pay rise. I'm doing some extra hours. I asked my boss for a pay rise. I started babysitting one night a week. I'm doing office cleaning after hours. I've started selling stuff on Trade Me. It's amazing what people buy. And now my income is up to $60. $60. Life's looking good. So I'm going to just imagine that six because we're in New Zealand and we don't have paper money for anything less than a five. But now we're going to go to our living expenses. Our living expenses with a pay rise are going to be how much? $35, because I don't increase my circle because I have a vision. This is the key. Most people get a pay rise and lose their minds. We make progress because we don't give away everything that we've earned. So $35 and now 20 bucks is going to my debt. So this is good. Then I get paid again and I give my tithe. Imagine that's six. I'm going to to live on the 35 and then this is going towards my debt. And eventually the debt will be gone. The debt is gone. And now I move to a whole new level of living. I move to investing and giving. 
And because I've been faithful to God, my pay is now $70. Praise the Lord. Give me a big round of applause. I'm up to $70. And now the first thing I'm going to do, imagine that seven, I'm going to tithe it. My living expenses are going to be how much? $35 because I haven't increased my circle of living. Now I have $30. So now I'm going to say, okay, well, my first step is going to be that I'm going to invest 20 and I'm going to give 10. And I'm going to give that 10, sowing in faith to the expansion offering, supporting children and through world vision, making a difference in the persecuted church, through open doors, whatever it is. But I'm going to sow that seed in faith, believing that I'll get a harvest on it because I've been faithful to God. Then I get it paid again, and we repeat the process. They put the money into here, that's that. Then we put the 20 into here, and we put the 10 into there. Now I'm moving to the next level because I'm not paying off debt. I'm saving towards my next financial milestone, likely to be owning my first house. Now life gets really exciting. Because after I stay faithful to this journey, if I stay faithful to this journey, then eventually I get to the point where I am ending up every week improving in the right direction, keeping on going, and now I get to a point where I have a whole new deal, and that is called assets. You bought a house. You have money in KiwiSaver. You have some money in an arid and in a managed fund. And now these assets are making you income. Now, the money in KiwiSaver is going to double on average every seven years. Your house is going to double on average in value every decade. So my salary might not be going up quickly, but I am now increasing financially because at the end of the day, the big, big picture of money is that it's not about what you earn. It's about what you own. I want to give credit to that. That's Shahan Joseph, our services pastor. But it's not about what you earn, it's about what you own because once you have assets, money is working for you. So we we want to work out how much we own, we take what we currently own, we take off what we owe, and then we end up with what's called our net worth. So here's the thing, your income will always be fickle. I mean, during the COVID pandemic, my income went down. But because I had money in KiwiSaver and I own my own house, I probably had the most significant year of financial increase that I've ever had. Without the assets, then I have no security over what's going to happen next. So in moving forward in my financial journey, these are the steps that I take. I reduce my circle of living. I get a clear budget. I tithe, I live, and then I save my disaster fund. Once I've done that, I pay off my debt. Once I've done that, I begin to invest and to give. And if I keep sticking to this journey, eventually I end up in the place where I've got assets. And now, my friend, it's like the money is just all coming to this point. And this is now you're in the right place because you may not be able to exponentially increase your income, but the assets are going to cause your financial position to increase in your life. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to stay focused. We're going to stay consistent. We're not going to quit. If you make a bad decision, you're going to move on. Make another good decision. Come back to your budget. Start over. You're going to get in a life group if you need it. Get advice and prayer. You're going to never get discouraged. You're never going to binge spend. You're going to keep consistent. You're going to live with God's principles. And God is going to abundantly bless your finances. And you're going to live three times as a result of a life that is lived with financial prudence. If you believe that, give your God some praise right now. The band can come and join me up on stage. And my friends, I believe this is a plan that will help you. Very practical today, but I'm hoping that you can hear it. Hey, if if you're just taking it in for the first time, download this on YouTube. It'll be up by midnight. Watch it tomorrow. Watch it the next day and start to absorb this journey. But whatever you do, don't stay stagnant, letting money happen to you. You are supposed to be in control of your money and God absolutely wants to bless your financial future. If you believe that, give God some praise in every location right now.
Wow. Who thinks that was awesome? Absolutely. I, um, I hardly know how to tie that up, but I think it's a principle that we can live by because I believe God wants to bless us financially and there is a process in which to do it. So that will be up on the internet um, with all the notes available. Make sure if you haven't got them, you've got the notes. Next week will be the, the final one in this series, and I'm looking forward to it. It's absolutely brilliant. But uh, I believe that God is wanting to prepare us financially for where we are heading internationally um, in terms of finances and the global economy and so on. So I believe that this is very, very important, and um, that's why we've, we've done this. I've never done it before, but I know that God is really speaking to us and wanting us to get ourselves properly aligned. Now, we have people in the church, if you um, are no good with money, as he said, that's no excuse, but we have got people in the church who can help and could give you advice on budgeting and help you work all of that stuff out. If you have a need in that area, I encourage you to talk to uh, Melissa and she knows the people that she can um, align you to. I've got a whole heap of businessmen um, that I, I work with once a month that come to, you know, we gather together and they are very, very, um, very successful. In fact, a number of our businessmen right now are overseas. One I just found out is in China right now. Um, so, you know, God is doing some amazing stuff with our businessmen because they have followed these principles. The final thing I want to say is that um, we will be putting together a seminar, a Saturday, couple of days, a couple of Saturdays, probably now it'll be at um, next, early next year, where my businessmen are going to put on a mentorship program to mentor you if you want to do business. So... Even if you want to start now, we've got businessmen that can talk to you, but ultimately we're going to do a Saturday seminar because one of the questions that our businessmen often ask people is, well, what's your plan? What's your financial projections? How are you financing it? All these sort of questions. And people are just saying, well, I'm just praying about it. Well, that doesn't work. You've got to have a plan. You've got to have a process. So, so we're going to be helping with all of those sorts of things. We have people that can help you and make you successful. Let me pray right now. Please, just uh, close your eyes and just focus in on the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you right now for just a brilliant revelation and understanding that John has brought. And uh, we receive it. And as we prepare for the last, the last message next week, Father, just continue to give, give encouragement and faith, even to those who are really struggling here today. Give them great encouragement that there is a way through and a way to become prosperous. So, Father, just encourage people with what's being taught. Help them and, Father, connect them in. Father, with our connect groups, with our businessmen and all the rest of it, so that success would be our portion. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget, people, that we've got a CAPS course, Christians Against Poverty, running. And so we've got all sorts of facilities to help you. God bless you. And there's prayer happening shortly in the um